I'm Wayne with Lone Wolf Hot Rods. Super tuning a carbureted car for weather and altitude is absolutely critical for performance. Modern electronically fuel injected cars are, for the most part, capable of doing this all by themselves. But with the Stone Age carbureted cars I like to mess with, you have to do the work manually. Super tuning is difficult to accomplish mechanically, but some of the foundation required to get there tends to be complicated. We'll go through it step by step, so hang in there. So how do you compensate? Basically, you have three tuning tools at your disposal. Then, along with a couple other tricks, the tuning tools include ignition timing, carburetor jetting, and valve lash. All three are used to pick up the performance, but before we begin, think about this. In a dyno test, the results are, con are, are correct at the dry air. That's air without water vapor. This seldom exists in the real world. Okay, well, maybe like never. And, and the typical weather forecast provided by the local TV station doesn't, doesn't provide all of the answers either. Quite honestly, a broadcast humidity percentage is only a fuzzy interpretation of the real conditions. Water vapor in the air is, is the key. The actual amount of water vapor in the air varies with the temperature. Even though the humidity percentages may, may seem equal, that's why dew points are a better gauge of moisture content in the air. Dew points are often provided by local airport weather stations or on dedicated, dedicated television aviation weather channels. Google search dew point and your closest airport. While well, common with most public weather forecasts, relative humidity doesn't provide all of the answers. The Canadian Forces Air Command Weather Manual, which is basically an inch thick and, and is the pilot weather textbook, provides this example, and I'm quoting it. Air with 100% relative humidity at 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit uh, it holds 30 grams or roughly one ounce of water vapor per cubic meter or roughly 35 cubic feet. But at 6 degrees Celsius or 43 degrees Fahrenheit, it only holds 7 grams or roughly one quarter ounce. In both cases, there's 100% relative humidity but the actual water content is quite different. Relative humidity, therefore, does not give you as, as direct uh, an indication of moisture as does dew point. For this reason, dew point and, and, and not relative humidity is provided for most aviation purposes. Now, the dew point is, is the temperature to which the unsaturated air must be cooled at a constant pressure to become saturated. Um, the higher the dew point figure, the more water vapor there is in the air. Um, the difference between temperature and the dew point provides an indication of how close the air is to saturation. The numerical difference is often referred to as the spread. A spread of zero means the air is saturated. There's a golden rule when it comes to dew point. That golden rule goes like this. The smaller the spread between temperature and dew point, the higher the relative humidity. The bottom line here is to cross-check the dew point against the temperature, then use that as a more accurate gauge of water vapor in the air. Now, some of you with weather stations, racer weather stations, will, will be able to check this by using grains. But for the most, most part, little guys like me or, or a lot of other people watching this, this video will not have a weather station in their garage or, or with them when they drive around in their car. Hence the need for, for knowing what the dew point is. So now you're going to need a tune-up. The problem is I can't give you exact numbers for a tune-up. I can't tell you exactly how much ignition timing you can take away or add. I can't tell you how much jetting you can take away or add. I can't tell you how much valve lash to change. I can just give you general parameters. The reason for this is every combination will be different. Every elevation change will be different. Every weather condition will be different. So where do, be where do you begin? Well, when it comes to dew point spread, and as it becomes smaller, there's more moisture in the air. That means you can increase ignition timing. Because there's more water vapor ingested by the engine, the chances of detonation decrease. That's just like water injection. You can add more total timing, but how much more total timing? That depends. For example, here's a, uh, just a, an old rule of thumb that, that claims that you can add one degree of timing for every 10% increase in humidity to a maximum of four degrees of extra timing. That might still work, but just keep in mind that humidity percentages are hardly accurate. 
Remember, too, that the engine combination with flat-top pistons, for example, for the most part will be more efficient and can generally function properly with less ignition timing than, than an engine with a big dome uh, in the piston. Nonetheless, when, when adding timing to your engine, pay particular, uh, particularly close attention to the spark plugs. Detonation is a sure sign you've gone too far. Once the performance improvements stop, then stop adding ignition timing. Air density decreases with temperature. Uh, hot air is less dense than cold air. Why? There are fewer air molecules in a given volume of warm air than in the same volume of cool air. Since there are fewer air molecules in warm air, then the air-fuel ratio in the engine has to be changed to compensate. This is accomplished by reducing the jet number, right there, or jet, jet size, and lean the engine. How big a change should you make? Well, there's another ancient rule of thumb that states you should change or reduce the jet number by one for every 20 degrees Fahrenheit of temperature increase. It too isn't cast in stone. The best way to compensate is to decrease jet numbers one at a time until either the performance improvements cease or the spark plugs show that the mixture is too lean. When it comes to jetting, there's another uh, rule of thumb that states for every seven to 800 feet of change in altitude, the jetting should be adjusted. Basically, this is the same thing as an increase in temperature. As the altitude increases, uh, the available air molecules in a given volume decrease. The solution decrease that jet size as the altitude increases. Just be positive to use the same one at a number time at a time methodology and don't be shy about double checking these guys. It's not uncommon for professional racers to build a special high compression ratio engine combination for racetracks at places like Denver. Of course, not all of us live at uh, in the Rocky Mountains and few of us can afford to build a special high altitude engine. But there's one more tuning tool you can use to compensate for increased altitude or higher temperatures, and that's valve lash. By increasing the lash, adding more lash, then you effectively shorten the camshaft duration. This, this also effectively decreases the overlap. In turn, the engine can build more cylinder pressure. The idea here is to tune the intake lash first. Try increasing the lash by no more than eight to 10 thousandths. If the performance of the car improves, then try the same technique on the exhaust side. Some engine combinations will pick up with the intake lash change only, while others will, will require both the intake and the exhaust side changed. Uh, never go beyond the eight to ten thousandths of an inch uh, valve lash change figure unless the cam manufacturer advises otherwise. In, in, in any case, remember that you're artificially increasing the compression ratio of the engine. Because of this, there's a chance that the engine might detonate. And here's that reminder again, keep an eye on your spark plugs. They're an absolutely critical part of the combination and they're definitely the window to what's inside or what's going on inside your engine. Varying shift points can provide benefits, particularly when the barometric pressure changes. For example, if the barometer dips less barometric pressure, then your engine becomes less efficient. That's pretty straightforward. But how do you compensate? That's easy. Increase the shift point RPM. Now this is a, is a big, and I mean really big, generality. In the case of a power glide equipped car, then it's a simple step. Try increasing the shift point by 100 RPM increments. If the car picks up, add another 100 RPM to the shift point. In most cases, there's a ceiling to these changes. Roughly three to 400 RPM is, is all the camshaft and valve springs will, will, will tolerate, and it should be enough to improve performance. In a car with something like a five-speed gearbox, then you might open up a really big can of worms. The car might like an extended shift point on the 1-2 and nothing more. On the other hand, uh, it might like an extended shift point on the 2-3 and 3-4, and but not on the 1-2 or 4-5. It all depends on the car, and it all depends on the conditions. It, essentially, what you're doing when extending the shift point is making inertia work for you. Um, and the engine is, is operating in a, higher, in a higher torque band. It doesn't fall down as low on the gear change particularly at a time when there's a decided lack of engine efficiency. Across the screen, you'll find a number of things you can use to bolt on the car in order to compensate for weather. They're simple and easy to use. The weather is something you absolutely have no control over, but you can compensate. Just remember to be extremely conservative when making, making tuning changes and follow up with diligent spark plug monitoring. Otherwise, the effects can be just as bad as the weather.